Hey everybody, um, here we go. This is, what week is this? This is week nine on our Bible study. Uh, we are covering February 27th, which was <clears throat> Luke 14 through yesterday, March 5th, which is Luke 20. Let's go ahead and we'll jump right into this and uh, get it going. We'll do what we did before. I will just read the scripture and then read the devotional, and then we'll talk about the question um, that I'd laid out. Um, hope everybody's uh, coming to First Tuesday tonight. Leslie and I are excited about it and, um, and uh, just really looking forward to, to sharing about our Israel pilgrimage. All right, here we go from February 27th, Luke 14. The scripture I gave for that day was, and approaching, the slave reported these things to his Lord, then enraged the master of the house told his slave, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in here the destitute and crippled and blind and lame. Talking about coming to the great banquet. So here's what I wrote. Who is it that God has invited and continues to invite to the great banquet? The answer is everyone. We are literalists in concept, but not in actuality. Because the actuality of the destitute and crippled and blind and lame eating beside us is too much to bear. We must be acquainted with and accustomed to actuality. The great banquet is not one of intangible conception. In actuality, the great banquet is already occurring. Each day, God brings to us table mates who possess equal invitations. If we sit and eat, if we sit and listen, if we sit and converse, if we sit and commune, if we overcome our repulsions, our prejudices, our disdain, if then we find ourselves at the great banquet that is and also is to come. The even greater reality is the personal recognition of our own destitution, crippled condition, blindness, and lameness. Judging the fitness of others never brings about fitness of oneself. Instead, it brings the revelation of personal unfitness. So, live in actuality. Live in welcome. Live in the recognition of personal insufficiency. God has invited you and everyone to dine at the great banquet. And then I, I asked you to look at this as your meditation for that day. It comes from an old hymn. And, and, and the meditation was this, let us break bread together on our knees. Everybody, everybody is welcome to be part of the great banquet. God sends out an inclusive call for everyone to come through Christ and enter into the great banquet, which is life. And when, when we recognize that everyone is invited, it'll probably be because we were on our knees um, in, in a position of, of humble um, submission to the Lord our God and honestly to other people. Because Jesus says that uh, the best thing we could do is serve other individuals. So my question for uh, February 27th on Luke 14 was this. In what ways are you already engaged in the great banquet? I think when we read parables such as this one, that what we think about is, is simply that, that day in the future when Jesus sets everything as, as, as it was originally intended to be. And, you know, we've heard the language, you know, everyone goes to heaven or, the, you know, when, when the last days occur and Jesus returns and we're all going to be sitting down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, you know, then, then that will be the great banquet. And so I'm going to do the best I can to live in a way that I can, uh, you know, being good and being moral and being right and being true and, giving my life to Jesus Christ and all of those things. And all of those things, let me stress this, all of those things are very important. And, and, and when we do that, and we are that, then one day we'll be at the great banquet. But, but what we need to begin to realize is, is that it's how we live out the great banquet now, right now, that determines whether or not we'll be at the great banquet then. There's a great banquet going on around us all the time. You know, Jesus says in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John that, that we are to eat his flesh and drink his blood because his flesh is true bread and his blood is true drink. 
we are to be taking in Christ every single day. And we are to look around us right now and say, who is it that I need to be sitting down at table with? Who is it that I need to be having a conversation with? Who is it that I need to be sharing God with? That's, that's the real indication as to whether or not you're prepared for the one day great banquet. How are you living out the great banquet now? Are you feeding on Christ? Are you drinking Christ? Are you welcoming people who you never would have welcomed before into your life and showing them the love of God rather than judging them and keeping them on the outside looking in? Just, just welcome people into your individual life. And I haven't even mentioned the whole concept of, of, of just, um, you know, the whole idea of not grabbing at things or positions or places or anything like that, but simply experiencing God in the very moment. Eternity is before us right now. If, if it weren't, why would we pray the words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? God's asking us to pray that prayer right now. Now, not just for one day. We, we want His will and His ways to be present on this earth right now, just as it is in heaven. That's why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. So this is the concept that we're working at right now. We want to be living out the great banquet every single day. We eat and we drink the flesh and the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. We welcome all people into God's presence to receive the love of God. And we begin to realize that we're not grabbing at places and things and spaces and positions and occupations and, you know, uh, ideologies. We're not doing any of that. We are sitting down day after day with people that God absolutely loves, who we may or may not even know, but we're sitting down with those folks every single day and sharing the love of God with them. And that way we're enjoying the Lord's presence. So there you go with that one. That it was February 27th and that was Luke 14. Now let's look at February 28, which is Luke 15. The scripture that I gave you that day was the first half of the 17th verse of Luke 15 and then all of, of, of verse 20. So let's, let's take a look at those, you know, kind of two scriptures there. It says, and coming to himself, that's verse 17 of chapter 15 of Luke. It's, it's that first half. And coming to himself, the younger son, verse 20, rose and went to his own father. And while he was yet far away, his father saw him and was inwardly moved with pity and ran and fell upon his neck and kissed him fervently. What I wrote was this, prodigalism never pre-qualifies its members. Hear that again. Prodigalism never pre-qualifies its members. There are prodigals alive and doing not so well across all racial, religious, socioeconomic, and creedal classifications. For either short stints or many years, all of us either know one or have been one. With a masquerade of stable independence and with short bursts of riotous living, the prodigal progressively dissipates his fortune. All the while, his family is experiencing a meantime that overflows with more moments of breath-sucking heartbreak and wonderings than the fleeting seconds of paramount joy that come with crumb-like, distant contact from the prodigal himself. Will it, can it ever change? Will it, can it ever be like it once was? Wounds can scar but scars rarely return to the likes of an infant's skin. Those who love them must always keep looking, but allow their prodigals to lose everything, come to themselves and rise and go to their fathers. Fathers must never be leaving, but always be looking. Then, when he is a far way off, fathers will see, be inwardly moved with pity, run, and fall on their necks and kiss them. The disease of prodigalism will always be among us, yet there is a cure. The cure is an elixir of losing it all, coming to one's senses, finding one's own way home, and finally, 
love, and forgiveness. Such is the prescription for prodigalism. That's a tough one because the reality is every single one of us, every one of us, whether we've been the prodigal or, or we have a, a, a prodigal in our family, every single one of us um, has experienced uh, this, this beautiful parable of, of the lost son. Uh, here's, here was the questions. There's actually two questions um, that I asked you to think about that day. And I, I'm just going to tell you a story uh, from my own personal experience in order to answer both these questions. The, the two questions are these. Why must we allow prodigals to lose it all, come to their senses, and find their own way home? And then the second question was this. In the meantime, how are you to foster love and forgiveness? Let, let me just tell you a story. I had a friend years ago. Um, I think we were, I think we were at this, this location at 540 Fairmont Road. Uh, yeah, we were, we were, we were, we weren't still down over, over the hill at the, at the old, the old location. We were here at 540 Fairmont Road and I had a friend who was an IV heroin addict and, uh, was homeless, living on the streets of, of San Francisco and, um, decided that he wanted to come home. And so uh, his parents and I arranged for, for him to get a flight back. And he flew from, you know, I remember now, he flew from San Francisco, where, where he was living on the streets, to Phoenix, and from Phoenix to Pittsburgh. And um, we, we, we picked him up uh, that, that night. It was a Saturday night. I'll never forget it. We picked him up that Saturday night at the, um, at the, uh, the airport. His dad and I did. And we, we, we brought him back here uh, to Kingdom, and uh, um, we let him eat in the car. We had a, a sandwich for him and, and um, some chips and some food. And it, it, it was the most awful sight that I'd ever seen. Um, he's probably about 30 years old at that point, um, probably 6'1", 6'2", but laid, weighed less than, I'll say, 165 uh, pounds, probably about 150 pounds. He weighed, had lesions all over his body. It was just a mess. So we, we took him down to Fairmont General and uh, went to the emergency room because we had been promised that he would be able to get into the detox ward of, uh, of Fairmont General to detox from, from IV heroin. And uh, it was a long night in the emergency room that night. We were there all night long and had to get up the next morning and then, and then do the service. But uh, it was going to be a long journey, and it was. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was a super long journey. But we got him in the detox ward, and he was there for almost two weeks detoxing from IV heroin. I, I, w I won't say that I was there every day, but I was there many days and um, experienced a lot of things with this young man. Um, when he was going through all of that. And so we, uh, we finally got him out of detox and had arranged for him to go to a rehabilitation center um, right, right off the exit where Cracker Barrel is in, in Fairmont. And so I took him down there myself. I picked him up, um, bought, him some, I bought him a carton of cigarettes, not a pack, bought him a carton. Some of you may be saying, why'd you buy him cigarettes? Honestly, when you're dealing with somebody who's addicted to IV heroin, I'd rather him smoke cigarettes than shoot heroin. So, you know, if you fault me if you'd like, or, or you can walk in my shoes. I bought him a carton of cigarettes and got him into the rehab facility there. Uh, never forget, it was a Tuesday morning. And uh, took him and, 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 and dropped him off and uh, got him all registered in and so on and so forth. And wished him well, told him I'd visit him. Usually they have no contact for a certain period of time with anybody. And, uh, and then you get to see him on a, on a limited basis. But anyways, dropped him off and uh, headed back here to Kingdom because I had a 10 o'clock in the morning Bible study. I will never forget that. I had a 10 o'clock in the morning Bible study. It was a senior citizen's Bible study that I was running um, here at Kingdom. No sooner did I get back to my office and got ready to teach this Bible study than the phone rang. And I answered the phone and it was the man that I had just checked my friend in um, with at the rehab uh, facility. And he said, Reverend Kane, I just wanted to let you know that, and I'm not gonna use the young man's name, we'll just, we'll just call him, you know, Jay. Um, said, Jay just left and, uh, and uh, checked himself out of the program. And I said, what? Go get him. What do you mean he checked himself out of the program? 
And this was the first just smack in the face with reality that I'd ever received in terms of prodigalism and how to properly care for him. I received two that day. This was the first. The guy that ran the rehab facility said, Reverend Kane, let me explain something to you. We don't keep people in rehab who don't want to be in rehab. That, that was a shocker to me because I thought, I believed with all my heart that while the individual was weakened as a result of their addiction, that, there, that it, it was proper to force someone into um, you know, a rehabilitation program. But I have learned since then, you cannot make anybody do something they do not want to do. And if you're trying to get somebody into a rehabilitation facility, they will not. They will not fight to keep them. They, they will talk to them. They will try to encourage them. But if a person wants to go, they will not keep them there against their will. That's my experience. You may have had a different experience, but that is my experience. So when that rehab facility director said that to me, I, I, I thought he was the most awful person in the world. I jumped in my vehicle and I went searching for my friend. And I looked all up and down I-79. I was driving all over the place. I could not find him. I looked and looked and looked and looked. And I finally just gave up. I mean, tears were streaming down my face. Um, just thinking we came so close and now we'd lost it all. And uh, so I just, uh, I drove back to Morgantown. And, I, and I, strangely, it was, it was kind of ironic. When I called Danny Bugs, because, you know, those of you that know me well know that, that he's, you know, one of my primary spiritual mentors. When I called Danny Bugs and told him about, you know, what happened, and, you know, I, I expected him to be sympathetic. He jumped my case so hard. And this was the second lesson I received. And honestly, it's the motivation for this devotional. Daniel said to me, he said, you stop that crying. I don't want to hear that anymore. Well, now I'm thinking, my goodness, my mentor's being callous. But then he said this to me. He said, you know the parable of the prodigal son. When did that boy come home? And I had to think about it. I, I mean, I don't even know if I answered, but he said to me, that young man came home when one, he came to his own senses, and two, he found his own way home. And that's what Daniel said to me. He said, you know, that daddy never left the house. And look, I don't need people quoting me the book of Jude. I understand sometimes you got to pluck people from the fire. I totally understand that. And I've done that too. But in, in most cases, and this is why it's so dangerous, because it's a, it's a scary thing you're doing by letting people be out there on their own. But I'm telling you, you can't save them. You cannot save them. They have to make that decision. They have to make that decision. And Daniel was right. Until the young man in the prodigal story, and until my friend um, in the prodigal story came to his senses and found his own way home, nothing was going to change. But that dad waited at that window every day. Notice what it says. When he was a long way off, I mean a long way off, dad saw him and ran to him, <coughs> excuse me, wrap, wrapped his arms around him and... Um, kissed him on the neck and uh, welcomed him home. And that, I mean, I'm telling you, that, that is just, that's a huge deal. I mean, it is just a huge, huge deal that that, did that that dad did that. And notice too, and we have to see this in terms of God's forgiveness. I mean, I could talk about this forever, but anyways, we have, we have to see that in terms of God's forgiveness. Did the young man confess? 100%. So if anybody says, oh, there doesn't have to be a confession, Confession's a huge part of this. I mean, realizing the wrong that, that you've done and the wrong that you're in. Two, having the wherewithal to take the initiative to find your own way home. And then, and then when you are home, when you are at that place where the person who can forgive you can forgive you, there has to be some level of, of, of confession of, of individual sin. But notice what the father does here. The father stops him, stops him, says, ah, da, 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 da. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. You are dead and you are alive again. You are lost and you're found. And he welcomes that son in. Now, you can strain out gnats and swallow camels on this scripture if you'd like. But, but, but the scripture says what it says. And Jesus is the one that said it. So we're going to have to go with what Jesus said. And so that's, that's really the answer for prodigalism. But look, if you have a prodigal right now, we're praying for you. We seriously are. We pray for, for lost sons every single day. But, um, 
don't think. I mean, if you're a parent of a prodigal, don't think that you did something. I mean, we all make mistakes as parents, but everybody makes the decision on their own. You didn't make that decision to, for your child to leave home or your grandchild to leave home. You, you didn't you know, make them start smoking weed or shoot a, shoot a needle into their arm. But when they're ready to come home, you, you cannot be so wounded, so hurt, so angry that you're not willing to welcome them when they come back down the path. You know, we all will experience this in some form or another, but we, we, we need to make sure that we, we let them take responsibility, but we're always there with the love of God. So, okay, let's jump on. Uh, Luke 16, and this was March the 1st. So let's see what we got here. Luke 16, it was verse 11. If therefore you are not faithful with dishonest mammon, who will entrust you with true wealth? Here's what I wrote. Ultimately, everything physical has a connection to the spiritual. God is creator, all else is creation. Certainly, humanity has taken portions of creation and re reassembled the pieces and called it creation. But reassembly of what is does not transform anyone into creator. Creation traces its inception to God, and thus everything physical has a connection to the spiritual. In order for individuals to handle the holiest of things, first there must be God-honoring stewardship over the most common of things. Chad Robertson is the bread baking genius behind the world famous bakery Tartine. Realizing the spiritual parallel or not, his words should be seen as a parable as he writes. Learning a craft is as much about copying as it is about understanding, as much visual as it is intellectual. As an apprentice, I watched, bakers bake, uh, I watched bakers making bread and then cleaned up after them. Eventually, I got my hands in the dough. Jesus reminds us of our arrogance. We are a people who claim to be worthy of baking as master bakers before we have even taken the time to get dirty from the flour we have been called to sweep up. Becoming bakers who bake the greatest bread will take care of itself when apprentices are committed to only being bathed in the flower. Before one can truly hear and see, eyes and ears, ears and eyes, must receive enough flour to be clogged and then cleaned. Sweep floors and baking will take care of itself. So the scripture was, if therefore you are not faithful with dishonest mammon, who will entrust you with true wealth? Are you content to sweep flour? You know, Jesus, um, Jesus uh, lays this point out a lot. I mean, he just, he just really does. We are all so desirous, so desiring of, 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 of wanting to go out there and perform a great miracle or, you know, pray a great prayer or, you know, a lot of people say, well, I should be in that position. I can't stress this enough. You have to be willing to give your position because it's not your position. Every single person in life has a specific calling by God. I mean, it's that simple. It really is. And no one is better than anybody else. You are simply called to do your job when God calls you to do your job. I mean, that, that's it. That's what it's all about. That's everything. That is everything. And whether God asks you to do the most dramatic of tasks or the most menial of tasks, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And when we start thinking about those things like, oh, I should be doing this or that person should be, it's, it's a waste of your time. Stop thinking about that. When we want all these huge things to happen in our lives spiritually, God says, why don't you just be content to sit with me for a little while? Oh, well, come on. I mean, God, anybody can do that. Well, I don't know. 
Can anybody do that? Have you tried to do that? Have you tried to wrangle control from God through the scriptures or through a praise song or prayer time? Now you may say, whoa, 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 whoa. what are you talking about, pastor? How, how would we try to gain control by being in the Bible? We, we control what we read sometimes. God may say, I want you to listen to this. And you say, well, I prefer this song. What the heck? God said, I want you to do something small here, and you're trying to create over here. That's, see, that's the problem. When, when we are not allowing God to create in the areas where he desires to create, and, and, and we're trying to, to, to work in an area where God says, look here, I'm not even there yet. What are you doing? You got to get back. You got to get back, and you got to follow God's lead. If Jesus says, if you want to be first, then you need to be last of all. Then we have to be content with the most menial of tasks in terms of how we define them. There are no menial tasks. God doesn't see menial tasks. But it's because we judge important tasks versus menial tasks that shows that, that we're not faithful with deep spiritual things sometimes. God wants us to be faithful with those deep spiritual things. And look, I'm, I'm just going to tell you out of my experience. The, the, the deeper I'm going with Christ, okay, and, and even just saying Christ is, is, is incomplete, the deeper I'm going with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the deeper I'm going with God, the less grandiose this thing becomes. Silence is not easy to sit in. It is not. To just sit in the silence and wait for God to speak and not think about other things, not try to control the conversation, not try to control the moment, just to sit there with God until He speaks. I'm going to tell you what, that's most, one of the most difficult things you can do. Consider what, what Jesus said to the disciples. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Watch and pray that you not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Now, don't make this about some dualistic mindset of spirit and flesh. Come on, don't reduce it to that. Because this whole thing works together. But the reality is, all Jesus wanted them to do was stay awake. Peter was unable to offer a Pentecost sermon until he had surrendered himself in, in such a way that he could pray for a couple of hours while he was tired. We have to consider these things, the smallest of things. That's why Jesus says, before you want to start preaching to the masses, why don't you just welcome a kid? Why don't you just welcome a kid? Instead of trying to feed the world, why don't you clean out a lunchbox, you know? We had a person come here a couple of weeks ago and tell us how, you know, I'm not going to tell you he or she, but the person said, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to help you all and I want to do this. The person wasn't even part of kingdom, but they came in and started, you know, lecturing to, to Daniel and I. And I, I looked at the person and I said, why don't you start, inst instead, of, instead of trying to, to do all this stuff around here in terms of helping kids, why don't you come and, and Clorox a lunchbox one Monday, you know? Um, people are ready to, to conquer the world and, and they haven't even conquered their own soul yet, you know, or allowed their soul to be conquered, I guess I should say. Just, just start small, please. Start small. And when you start small, you'll be shocked just how big it is. I mean, I, I could rail on and on about all these things forever, but, but, but that's the reality. Start small and big, big takes care of itself. Just, just be content with small. Big will take care of itself. That's, that's a huge lesson for, for all of us to learn. Okay, Luke 17. Let's go on. It was March 2nd. You're looking at Luke 17 here. Oh, this is a biggie. Um, sometimes I think people think I have all this stuff memorized. There's, there's a Whole lot going on in the head up there. <laughs> Anyways, all right, Luke 17, 18. When none found, or, or I'm sorry, these are Jesus' words, my fault. Was none found returning to give glory to God except only this man of another people? And, and what are we talking about? It's, it's the 10 lepers. 10 lepers come to Jesus to be healed. Um, uh, Jesus heals all of them. 10 go away. The, the, the one returns and comes back. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's it said that, uh, that he was a Samaritan. So here is, uh, here's the devotional that I wrote for that day. Ten lepers came for healing, all left healed. One returned to say thank you to Jesus. 
To him, Jesus says, was none found returning to give glory to God except only this man of another people? We can hone in on Jesus' words that declare the lack of thankfulness by 90%, or we can hear Jesus say, this man of another people. We can talk about thankfulness another day, as it is certainly necessary. But for now, let's consider Jesus' words saying, this man of another people. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the civil rights era of the 60s. Concerning this man of other people, Heschel writes, How many disasters do we have to go through in order to realize that all of humanity has a stake in the liberty of one person? Whenever one person is offended, we are all hurt. What begins as inequality of some inevitably ends as inequality of all. Let me say that again. What begins as inequality of some ends as inequality of all. Sadly, most of the world walks away with what is now theirs, while only the smallest minority recognize this man of another people in such a manner that drives them to the warranted worship of and gratefulness to Jesus. When the blessing of the Lord's touch personally upon us is coupled with compassion for the disenfranchised, the result is reflection of the image of God. Ultimately, we are not simply to receive, nor are we simply to offer. Ultimately, we are to reflect the image of God so that others will receive, offer, and equally reflect. Such is the life we are called to live. Reflect the image of God so that others will receive, offer, and equally reflect. So here was the question for that day. It wasn't really a question I asked you to, to explain. Explain the concept of reflecting the image of God so that others will receive, offer, and equally reflect. It, it, it's, it's very simple. We need to stand before God. I just read this a couple of weeks ago in, in a, a, a devotional that, that, uh, that I read. It was actually a, um, a newsletter from a, a devotional service that I get. And, and the man in the newsletter wrote this, that we are to be mirrors and masks. Let, let me actually start with the definition of mask first. Mask, he was saying in the old days, was used as a means of projection. Okay, so um, an actor in a in a theater, um, you know, play would take a mask and put it over their face, and it was to obviously resemble uh, some image that they were they were trying to portray. But they also used it almost like a megaphone. Um, the mask was so large and, and was constructed in such a way that it could project the 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 message of of the image you were trying to to display. And, and, and the, the, the second side of that was, well, it was actually the first side because he talked about mirror in the article first and then, and then mass second. But the, 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 the other side of that was mirror. And, and the guy asked such an interesting question. He said this, what, what is the job of the mirror? And he said, the job of the mirror is to receive the image that is before it. I'm going to tell you what, if we lived life like that, that would be amazing. We live our lives as, as mirrors. So whoever it is that's standing in front of us, whatever image is in front of us, we don't try to manipulate it. We don't try to dictate it. We don't try to turn it or shift it. We just receive it. We just receive the image that is in front of us. And as we receive the image that is in front of us, what we do is now we've got this mask and there's an image on that mask and there's a voice behind that image on the mask and we need to project the message of the image on the one that we haven't tried to turn or change or manipulate in any way. We just receive the image. We just receive the image exactly as it is and then we project. We project the message of the image 
that, that, that we're bearing. And, and that's what it means. When we reflect the image of God, we should do so in such a way, not to manipulate, but so that others will receive the message. And then when they receive the message, you know, if it, 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 initially, if it's a, an issue of conversion, then they'll, I guess they'll convert. And then as they convert, then their life begins to develop. And pretty soon, what they've received in terms of the love of God, they know that you cannot keep the love of God to yourself. If you truly receive the love of God, you, 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 you give the love away. You absolutely give the love of way, a love away. And, and as you're doing so, as you've received the love and given the love, then you're reflecting the image of God too. So that's, that's how it should work. All of us in our lives should reflect whatever, to, to whatever image is in front of us. We reflect to that image. That image should receive. As that image receives, that image should offer. And then as that image offers, then it is equally reflecting. And it's, it's just this pattern that never ends. That's, that's how we're supposed to be living the Christian life. And um, I think that's what uh, that Heschel was talking about. And I think it's what Jesus is talking about also in this passage. All right, we are to March the 3rd, uh, Luke 18. A couple more to go here. Luke 18, 22. But hearing this, Jesus said to him, one thing is still lacking in you. Sell everything, whatever you have, distribute it to the destitute, and you will have a treasury in the heavens and follow me. Here's what I wrote. Conceptualism must always be actualized. Theory is fantasy apart from actuality. The rich young ruler, as he's come to be known, was excellent with concepts and theories. He was a man of stated moral principles, and Jesus was truly pulling for him. But ultimately, the abundance of his heart is seen. Time and again, Jesus teaches there can be no division when it comes to surrender to Messiah. Jesus does not demand this allegiance as a taskmaster. Instead, he, with absolute truth, absolutely calls every individual. Life in him is an open door to all, but it is not an easy decision. Then and now, nothing has changed. Our lack lacking point is not in conceptualism, but in the actuality of selling our everything, whatever we have, and distributing, distributing what demands distribution to those in need. Treasury in the heavens will follow, as will our following of Jesus. And then my question that day in terms of the meditation was, have you acted on the one thing you lack? That was the question that Jesus asked that man. You know, uh, I, just one, one more thing, one more thing you lack, and I need you to take action on this point. And that was my question to you all that day too on the, on the, on the question for, for your study. Have you acted on the one thing you lack? Guys, I'm going to tell you something. That's one of the most difficult parts in all of this. Because, you know, when, when you have a ministry that is constantly sharing the love of God, constantly sharing the love of God, constantly sharing the love of God, we, we, we tend to overlook the, the, the need for repentance and confession and conversion. But I mean, you cannot read the Gospels and say, well, you, you, you don't have to repent. That's ridiculous. You absolutely have to re repent. You know, you, 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 you cannot read the Gospels and eliminate the concept of, of confession. Now, again, I'm not going to go back on what I said with the, the, the father to the prodigal, but, but it, when you're the one repenting, th there is, you know, there is a, a, a pattern of confession that, that you can see. I mean, in the, in the coming weeks, we're going to read the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. And Jesus, Jesus looks at that, that woman. He calls her to confession. He says, go get your husband. And uh, the woman says, well, you know what? I don't have a husband. He said, you know what? You are not lying. You've had five. And the one you're with now, also not your husband. And what's she say? Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Jesus doesn't harp on those things, but at the same time, he does call us to, to face the truth of the situation. So we repent, we confess, but conversion, conversion is, is that move. 
that move. When, when you read that 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, you can see the rich young ruler and his heart is broken over this whole thing. He, he knows. He knows that he's at a crossroads and he has to make a decision. Do I walk back into my old life or do I go with Jesus here? If you want to contrast that with the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John with this woman at the well that I was just you know, telling you about, there she is to, to, to get water into her water pot, you know, and, <coughs> and, and you know, head, head back into the city to live the old life. And when Jesus says, I'm the Messiah, he faces her with the decision. Do you just take your water pot and go back to your old life? Or, or do you run into town and say, you know what? Come meet a man who told me everything. I think I just found the Messiah. The rich young ruler had the choice before him. He wasn't blind to the choice. And he didn't, he, I mean, he chose not to repent. He chose not to convert. He chose not to say, you know what? You're right, Jesus. O- only God is good. And the only reason I came to you is, is honestly, I-, I believe you to be God. But now that you face me with this, this conviction is overwhelming on my life. And I can see you're not condemning me. You're welcoming me. You're welcoming me with your love. I can see it in your eyes. You love me and you want me to make this decision. So you know what, Lord? I- I'm coming with you. But that's not what the guy did. He did not do that. He didn't do it. And and we don't know what happens to him. I mean, I I hope he turned it around. I hope he turned it around, but he didn't. I mean, I've heard stories that Caiaphas became a Christian. I, I don't know. I don't know if he did or not. I hope he turned it around, but I mean, I don't know. You know, Pilate, was, was Pilate a Christian? I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Could he be in heaven? Oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. Is he? I, I don't know. And I'm not going to put him in hell. It's not my place. You know, people are quick to talk about Judas. We can debate that if, if you'd like. I, I don't know what the answer is. It doesn't say where these folks are in eternity. But one thing can be certain. You can have an assurance of salvation. You can know. If, if, if you have said, you know what? Jesus is right. That one thing I lack is a huge thing. And you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to go back to my old life. I'm just going to follow Christ the rest of my days. Wherever he leads me, I'm going to go. Whatever he tells me to do, that I'm going to do. And honestly, if I'm where he is and I'm behaving as he is, then this isn't about me just being in a place and doing some things that look like Jesus. You know what? Christ lives in me. And he's my hope of glory. And, and I, I just think that's the choice that everybody has to make. I mean, you don't have to, but it, 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 if, if you want to be sure that you're going to spend eternity with God, you, I mean, you're going to have to follow Christ. I mean, that, that's it. That's everything. So, all right, two more to go. Two more to go. I'm getting through this a lot quicker than we are in class. It's only uh, 43 minutes in here. And uh, we're already at Luke 19, so two to go, okay? And seeing this, everyone murmured saying that he went in to lodge with a man who is a sinner. (laughs) We're starting to pick up a common theme here, aren't we? Here's what I wrote. Does it really matter who the he is who went in to lodge with a man who is a sinner? Second question is this. Does it really matter who the man is who is the sinner? We are all the man. We are all called to be the he. Perhaps everyone should be less concerned with surrounding ourselves with non-sinners and more concerned with living as our Christ lived and continues to live. Jesus made it abundantly clear that we should not exclusively cloister with our fellow healthy Christian brothers and sisters while ignoring or bemoaning the sick among us. The spiritually sick do not need our denial, nor our anger, nor our pity. The spiritually sick need our acknowledgement of our equal personal sin and our blessing of Christ's love. The local church had better start looking out rather than exclusively, interiorly, fortifying its institutional character. Internal institutional fortification has simply insulated us from the need before us, the need which is Jesus' passion. 
So go find your Zacchaeus, because we once bore his name, and all continue to bear his name as we bear his name. Like Jesus, go in to lodge with a man who is a sinner. And then my question for that day was, who is the sinner with whom the Holy Spirit is calling you to go in to lodge? Folks, you're going to have to answer that question for yourself. The reality is, at one point of your life, at one point of my life, we were Zacchaeus up the tree. And so to sit back and just say, oh, well, you know, I, I, I have my salvation or forget that somehow you were once up a tree or, or somehow, you, you know, you or I believing just because, because look, I was raised in church. All I've ever known was church, okay? Somehow believing in our hearts that because we were raised in a, in a Christian tradition, that that doesn't qualify us for being Zacchaeus up the tree. Come on. Religion never saved anybody. Religion never saved anybody. In our religion, just like Zacchaeus in his you know, fraudulent tax collecting, in our religion and his tax collecting, both actions find us up a tree <laughs> and need for Christ to say, you know what, I'd like to come to have dinner at your house. And so when we remember that we ain't pure as the wind-driven snow, we weren't then, and frankly, we're not now. The, the, the purity that we possess is the purity of Christ in us. It's his purity. That's what allows us to stand before a holy God. It's the welcoming of the love of God. It's the welcoming of the purity of Christ. It, it's the fact that we go, well, how about that? He came and got me. And then, and then we go with him. It, 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 it's really that simple. That's what salvation is. He died on the cross and came and got me. We left with him at the resurrection. That, that's Christianity. That's it. And, and you know, that's, that's what this is saying. Zacchaeus is up a tree. And um, we need to realize that Jesus said, you know what? Church is fine. Church is fine. Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. I think we should go to church every single week. I'd be a fool if I said we didn't. You know, and a liar. Because frankly, I believe it. I think you should be in church every Sunday. I, I just... I, that's just what I believe. I think that's the rhythm of the Christian life. You can call me nuts or legalist or whatever, but I think you should be in church on Sunday worshiping God. I, I really believe that. And, and, and when, when we do that, we can't expect that the Zacchaeuses of the world are going to come into the synagogue. I mean, look at how these people behaved. They didn't even want Jesus to go to eat with them. You, you really think they would have wanted Zacchaeus in their synagogue? They didn't want anything to do with that guy. You know, you, you, you get out of here. If you're going to be the tax collector, go away. Jesus says, look, that's the whole reason I came because he is a tax collector. And I want that part of his life to go away. I want him to be an honest man, not a dishonest man. But somehow we believe in our churches that, that, that the dishonest are just going to show up. They're not coming. They are not coming in most cases. Will they stumble in our doors? Every once in a while. Every once in a while. But trust me, if they stumble in our doors, they're going to be looking as to whether or not we're behaving like, like Jesus, who says, how about we have a meal together? Or if we're behaving like those people that go, oh, how dare you, Jesus? How, there's no way. You should have never done that. That's ridiculous. We cannot live that way. And we can't just believe that because we have some great programs and great preaching and great music and comfy seats and you know, a comfortable atmosphere that somehow you know, we're, we're walking the streets of Jericho and calling people out of trees. Do you know what qualifies you for walking the streets of Jericho and calling people out of trees? Get to Jericho, not to church. I mean, go to church, but at the same time, please don't stay there. Get in the streets of Jericho and call some folks out of the trees. All right, here we go. Last one. And it's Luke 20. Oh, this is a biggie. I mean, this is a biggie. Everyone who falls on that stone will be shattered. But on whomever it falls, him it will utterly crush. That's Luke 20, verse 18. And here's what I wrote. We can all stand a little shattering. Embarrassment is not a bad thing. Embarrassment reminds us of our need for the Savior and the fullness of God. Shattering embarrassment has nothing to do with condemnation. I'm going to read that again because we cannot condemn people. Shattering embarrassment has nothing to do with condemnation. Shattering embarrassment has everything to do with the God who takes all the shattered pieces and reassembles them into the image of God. 
God certainly will always remind us of our fragility and God's divine desire to strengthen. But the healing, strengthening, shattered will never be reminded of the factors that brought about the shattering. Those factors have been removed as far as the east is from the west. Some never rise above the shattering. Some forget the necessity of shattering's acknowledgement. The wise allow the Christ upon whom we have fallen and been shattered to hold the balance between our shatter and God's strength. And the meditation for that day was fall, shatter, restore. And the question was this. Have you been shattered by the Messiah? And then the other question is, how are you remaining shattered? Uh, When Leslie and I were were moving into the first house that we built, we were moving furniture in. And it was like one of those days in March where it it was just warm enough to, to where you knew spring was on the way, but there was still snow on the ground. So it was super, super soupy out in the yard and we were moving, we were moving furniture in and I stepped off the back of this moving truck that we were working with and I, my my friend was with me and uh, I fell on the ground in the mud and I was so angry. It was the end of the day, the furniture that we were trying to move or the thing we were trying to move is now on the ground and I'm on the ground and it's wet and it's cold and the mud and the wet and the cold is now all over me. And my best friend, because he's earned the right, looked at me and he said, Did you hurt yourself or just your pride? Well, boy, I'll tell you what, I've thought about that a lot over the years. I've thought about that for, you know, nearly three decades since we built that house. And, um, you know, you just think about it. There are times in life where you get so out of control, it's, it's not a bad thing to be shattered. It's not a bad thing to fall in the mud and be embarrassed because what it does is it reminds you you're not perfect. God is perfect. It reminds us of our need for God. And, and honestly, that, that's a great thing. And so when, when, when you say, have you been shattered? I, I'm, I'm a person who believes that in order to come to Christ, there has to be a, there has to be a brokenness. I, I just believe that. You can say I'm wrong or, or, or whatever. That's fine. It's okay. And I'm not dismissing you by saying that. But I have come to know that when an individual stands in, in the presence of God, and this, this is my experience, I have come to know that there's a brokenness. I mean, when, when Abraham experiences the deep darkness of God, he hits the deck. When Adam and Eve have sinned and God's walking through the garden in the cool of the day, they, they hide. Um, you know, uh, you know, Moses is afraid in the presence of God. Um, you know, think about John on the island of Patmos. He's afraid in the presence of God. When Zacchaeus sees Gabriel, when Mary sees Gabriel, I mean, everybody's afraid. Everybody is afraid. Isaiah, and you guys know, you've heard me quote this scripture a million times from Isaiah 6. When Isaiah sees the, the train of the Lord's robe in the temple in the year that King Uzziah died, what he says is, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So anytime a person comes into the presence of God genuinely, they, they hit the deck. I mean, that, that's, that's just what it is. I mean, I can show you 500 biblical examples of that. And so I think before us, we always have to be reminded that God is God and we are not. And, and as, as we're driven to our knees appropriately, then the beauty of that is we know that God comes and restores because God always restores when a person falls before him with um, you know, genu- genuine love and genuine compassion and, 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 and genuine submission. It's, it's just the reality of the experience. So anyways... Um, it's a good thing to be embarrassed. It's a good thing to be shattered. It's a good thing to remain that way. Now, now again, it's not condemnation. It is not condemnation. The enemy is the accuser and he will accuse you and he will condemn you. But, but, but the reality is, um, man, do we have an obligation. We, just, we have such an obligation to recognize God for who he is, but then also recognize that there's a beautiful restoration 
um, when we bow on our knees in front of God. And honestly, it's just easier to live life bowed on one's knee than being required um, to, to hit the deck. Um, we, we, if you just do it, rather than get knocked off your horse, Saul, you know, oh, Lord, Lord, you know, why are you doing this? Who are you, Lord? Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, we don't ever want to hear that. We, we just want to live in a, in a, a constant state of submission. And uh, as we live that way, where we recognize the perfection that God is, the righteousness that God is, and we recognize that apart, apart from Him, we ain't got a leg to stand on. Um, that's, when, that's when we really begin to, to stand in a mighty way. So there you go. Uh, the lessons will be on the platform um, uh, for First Tuesday. So if you want to come up and get them, and I'll just leave them there throughout the week. And if you want to grab them on Sunday, if, you're, if, if, uh, you know, if you don't come to First Tuesday, they'll still be up there and you can still grab them if you're not able to come to First Tuesday. But I hope you do. And I hope you watch this. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, keep on pace. It's just a rhythm and chapter one day, uh, every day. So love you guys. God bless you. Talk to you.